<laughs> and good afternoon. My name is Tweet Coleman, and I'm one of the hosts for the Florida Aviation Network. We're broadcasting live and in the clear here in Central Florida Aerospace Academy in the Aerospace Room of Excellence in the center here. And we're at the, of course, uh, Sun and Fun Complex in beautiful Lakeland. And I say uh, Lakeland, uh, Florida, and it's beautiful today because the sun is out. It's about 80 uh, degrees or so and it's nice and sunny. So if you haven't been to Lakeland, Florida for Sun and Fun, be sure to put it on your uh, radar screen because it's really beautiful, isn't it, uh, Phil? Yes, it is, and we've got fantastic weather this week. Yeah, I think all week, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they yeah. predict all week it's gonna be great. And we're really pleased to have Phil Lockwood here. And Phil, I think you've been a guest here before? I have been, yep. Good. And it's a pleasure to be with you here today, Tweet. Yeah, my first time, so I'm going to hear all about the Rotec engine and uh, all the good news and the new engine that you have out right uh, on the uh, engine. But before we do that, I um, understand you're a uh, FIT grad right here in Florida? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, spent four years at FIT in Melbourne. Uh huh, uh huh. What'd you do after you graduated? I went to work in the industry uh, and, and actually went to work for a company called Max Air. Uh, way back in the 80s mm -hmm. and uh, uh, so I, I worked with them uh, became their sales manager and uh, helped them with uh, with tech some technical aspects of, of design and development of the drifter and uh, was able to work with uh, some National Ge Ge Geographic film crews oh. and do some bush flying in Africa and in the US too Wow. So you combine two things that you really like is aviation and photography? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I love, love uh, photography. And that plane offered a really good view. It was a great camera platform. Uh, the, you could film or do still photography from the front of that airplane and get great results. Wow, wow. And I understand you were on the cover of the National Geographic. Well, it wasn't me, but the, the stories that I was helping them with okay. uh, it turned out to be cover stories. Mm -hmm. uh, survivors of the Skeleton Coast and um, also the Nindoki, uh, Last Place on Earth, uh, was, uh, was a story using the first air cam uh, in the Nindoki rainforest in northern Congo. And that was another National Geographic kind of uh, uh, research project. Mm -hmm that was uh, featured in the, in the magazine. Yep, that was the cover story. Uh, and uh, the, the one that they worked on, I worked on with the Bartlett's mm -hmm. in the Congo, uh, that was a cover story. The last, uh, that was uh, uh, all about the, uh, the uh, uh, northern part of Namibia uh, called the Skeleton Coast Park. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How much time did you spend in Africa? Oh, let's see, uh, I made five, five trips, and yeah, I was usually there for uh, six weeks to two months at a time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they had fuel and uh, all your supplies that you needed to work with? Well, we had to bring it in, so that was one of the issues we needed in both cases. We needed airplanes that didn't need a lot of fuel, and they were easy to support in a very remote location. So the fuel was all brought in in tanks. In the case of the, the project we did in the Nadoki rainforest, we actually brought the fuel up river, up the Sangha River in uh, dugout canoes and 55 gallon drums. And we kind of had our own fuel depot where we would fuel the airplane on site. And we were operating out of a 600 foot strip, one way in, one way out. Mm -hmm. And when I landed that first air cam there, it was the first airplane to ever, ever land there. You have a lot of people come around, I would imagine. And I think there were about like 45 people that lived in that village, mm -hmm. uh, and in, uh, the, the village of Wayso, or uh, um, actually Wayso is where we, we got the fuel and did our uh, jump point, and that's where we, we had to run. It was about a, a day, a full day upriver uh, to get the fuel from uh, Wayso up to the spot where we were flying. What were some of the takeaways from that, that whole experience of flying there? And well, the, the deal in the Congo, we, we were flying over uh, pristine rainforest. And, and the problem with that is there was no place to land. And there was really no mechanism for rescue. 
So if we went down, some of the areas that we were going to fly over, we're looking at uh, maybe two weeks to hike out if you weren't injured and if you had uh, enough food and water and you could make it through the forest and know where you were going and everything. It was really dicey. So you really had very little chance of rescue. So that's where the twin engine thing came from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what did you do after then you had that experience with National Geographic? Well, the plane worked really well. And so I came back and built a second prototype um, because I enjoyed that type of flying so much and had been taught that if, you know with one engine, you need to kind of keep a place in, in mind to land you should, if, you, if possible, be within glide distance of a, a field at least, right? And so when you're flying low over rainforest or other things that are often interesting to photograph, there is no place to land. And so you're going to be at risk uh, while you're down low. And that's where the twin engine thing came from. That's where the air cam design came from. So we came back and we built a second prototype, brought it to Sun and Fun and Oshkosh. There was a lot of interest and decided to go ahead and uh, fully engineer it and turn it into a kit. And that, that resulted in t uh, 22,000 hours of engineering and, and uh, we put it in production okay. as a kit plane. Were you one of the builders of the plane? I was one of the guys who helped design it. Oh, you're the designer. And develop it and build it, yep. Yeah, the first air cam, we built it from scratch in six months. Uh, we put a team together and, and tore it apart pretty had to take it pretty far apart and packed it in, I think it was six crates, and shipped it off to, uh, uh, to uh, Namibia, uh, or actually to the Congo, that one. And uh, we, we received it in Brazzaville, the capital of Congo, and, and then I had to uncrate it and put it all together. And I pretty much had to do that myself, and then ferry it uh, about 400 miles uh, north across the equator to this airstrip that that we knew was going to be there, but no one had ever landed there. And, and you were by yourself? In, in when I made the ferry flight... 400 miles? I had uh, mm -hmm. a local uh, researcher with me. Um, his name was Mike Fay, uh, a super, super sharp guy, big adventure, uh, really dedicated to trying to save the rainforest. And uh, he also spoke uh, pretty fluent French, which was handy because that was the uh, that was the other language other than the native languages that uh, uh, the people who were pretty e well educated spoke. Mm -hmm. So he got all the paperwork we needed to make that ferry flight, and uh, uh, yeah, helped helped me uh, talk to the the police chief because if there was a police officer involved, he was going to speak French. But that was quite a amazing trip. When we landed to get fuel halfway up there, uh, I was going to land at a strip that was pointed out to me on, an air on a chart. And a local bush, bush pilot gave me some pointers, and he said, well, that airstrip's not there. And, okay, well, where can we go? And he said, well, if you land here at this latitude and longitude, there will be fuel there. Um, but that's the only place. So when we took off, I had to take his word that we were going to find an airstrip when we got to that latitude and longitude and that we were going to be able to find fuel. And so that's what we did. We landed at that spot. There was a little grass strip and uh, the local uh, villagers came out and uh, Mike Fay could communicate in French. And uh, uh, yeah, they, they, I grabbed my two jerry cans that I had brought with me and, and uh, they put me on the, on the luggage rack of a Pook scooter and we ran down this rutted road and they hand pumped the fuel out of the tanks in the ground into my tanks and we fueled the plane. And it was uh, just one of the adventures. Wow, v very trusting of them, isn't it? I mean, and to see the runway, I bet even the grass strip was pretty impressive. Well, it was impressive to see a grass strip in the middle of nowhere because right. like, uh, that was the only place to land for, for a long ways. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So uh, yeah, I, the, uh, yep, it was, Great adventure. <laughs> and so uh, you came back to the U.S. and uh, and you worked with the company l longer? Or? Well, I built that plane. Uh, so the, I had been doing work for the Bartlett team in Namibia prior to that. And uh, th so the group that was working on this research project in the Congo, mm -hmm. they came to me and said, hey, the Bartlett said that you were helping them with their 
aviation uh, requirements, and we're wondering if you could do the same for us. And, but the, we, in, the, in the desert, we were using single-engine airplanes, mm -hmm. which were appropriate because we could land almost anywhere. And we had two of them, so we always had a little a flight plan between us. And if one plane was going somewhere, you knew where it was going and when it was supposed to be back, and you could take the other one to go look for it if it didn't come back. In the Congo, we would have one airplane, one place to launch from, and, and no place to land other than that strip and no chance of recovery. So it was, it was almost like going into outer space. I mean, when you took off, if that machine did not bring you back, you might not come back. So, uh, it, it, and, and I told them I'd been working on the design for a twin. I showed them some of my drawings. And they said, well, I build the first one for us. And that's what we did. So that air cam number one was actually, uh, d once we'd finished the project, it was donated to the local research uh, team out there. It was damaged in a landing accident later on. And then uh, a guy by the name of Russ Salzvik, who was a Delta airline pilot, still is, I believe, he, uh, his brother was out there doing some research and came across the air cam and uh, bought it and had it shipped back and then Russ called me and he restored it and so later I traded it for a, a, a new air cam kit and then uh, EAA wanted the airplane so it ended up in the EAA Air Museum in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. That's where it is today. Uh, in the museum? Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah. interesting. I understand that you have a new engine now, the Rotex 916? So yeah, so in my other business, uh, the, uh, the Rotex uh, business, Lockwood Aviation Supply, uh, we are very, very excited uh, that Rotex has launched a new engine uh, today, at, or at the show, at the uh, show. yesterday actually they made the launch, uh, called the 916 IS, and it's a, it's a turbocharged, electronically fuel-injected and controlled engine that is uh, putting out 160 horsepower for takeoff and 137 continuous cruise power up to 15,000 feet. And, uh, and it can operate at altitudes of up to 23,000 feet. Okay, but continuous up to 15,000 feet? You fold the uh, full 137 up to uh, 15,000, oh, yeah. That's exciting. That's kind of where the oxygen comes in, yeah, doesn't it? that's right, yeah. <laughs> so who are your customers for this uh, motor, this engine? Well, there, a lot of them are people that were using originally 912s at 100 horse and then uh, 914s at 115, and then they moved to the... 915, uh, which could put out uh, 141, and so a lot of uh, higher performance two-seat uh, airplanes, uh, and, and there'll be some new designs, I'm sure, that you'll see coming out uh, built around the, nine, uh, the 916. Uh, and there's some four-seaters, too, like the Sling uh, TSI, which is a four-seat with great useful load. Mm -hmm. That's been running the predecessor to the 916, the 915. And so uh, I'm sure they'll want to put the 916 in that as well because it's about the same weight. Mm -hmm. and, and, but just more horsepower and, and more utility out of it. More horsepower, and, and they're also upping the TBO to 2,000 hours. Oh, 2,000 hours. Yeah. Okay. And what was the TBO? 1,200. Okay. Oh, that's, yeah, that's so, a quite a jump. Yeah, they... they They've learned a lot from the 915 mm -hmm. uh, over the past five or six years. What's a warranty on uh, that type of an engine? It's a really uh, great warranty. It's a great question because uh, on the 916 sold in the U.S., they will all come with a uh, five-year, 2,000-hour mm. warranty, which covers all the major components and all the electronics. Okay, that is. Now you say, uh, which is in the U.S., so the warranty is... Uh, it's optional in other countries. Okay. Uh, but the U.S. distributor has chosen to just uh, buy it because it has to be purchased with the engine when the engine is built. Uh, so we've decided, uh, uh, the importer has decided to just bring them all in with the warranty. Uh-huh, I understand. So you were talking a, a little earlier about the winter bla uh, blend auto gas. Yeah, as a Rotax service center, that's something that we, we work with. So yes. a lot of people run Rotax engines on auto gas, and, and the four strokes... Uh, will run on 91 octane or higher mm -hmm. autogas, yeah, uh, maximum of 10% ethanol, no more than that. 
Um, That's and, quite a savings, isn't it? It is. A yeah. lot of people are running auto gas, yeah. but there are some things that they should be aware of. Um, there is a winter blend. Mm -hmm. um, they should stop producing it uh, mid-June, and then you go to the summer blend. But the winter blend is more volatile, and if you're running winter blend fuel and you're seeing uh, ambient temperatures on the ground approaching 80 degrees, mm -hmm. uh, or you plan to go up above, I'd say, 9,000 feet, um, then you can run into issues. Maybe you should be running Avgas mm -hmm. at that point. Uh, um, but um, yeah, in cold weather, low altitudes, um, Autogas works great. And, and the summer blend Autogas seems to work well in the road taxes all, all, all the time. Okay. So your customers for this type of gas would be uh, what states primarily? Well, unfortunately, they're putting this winter blend fuel all across the country. Oh, they are? Yeah, so the issue is in the south, when you have winter blend fuel, but the temperatures get high, it'll still work in a car, mm -hmm. but in airplanes, there we you know we have you have to be careful. Mm -hmm. well, what would happen actually? Well, you can get vapor lock. Okay, mm -hmm. you, you don't want to do that at twelve or thirteen thousand. No, feet, and the, the fuel injected Rotax engines are much better suited to deal with that fuel, mm -hmm. especially if you're sand below ten thousand feet because of the way they circulate the fuel mm -hmm. helps keep it cool and it helps uh, uh, minimize the chances of vapor lock. Mm -hmm. The carbureted engines are, are more susceptible to that mm -hmm. if you're running this winter blend. So it's all about the winter blend fuel. Uh -huh. Yeah, that sounds good. Well, you're in several different uh, companies, or, or which one do you um, prefer? to work. You have oh, I, I like it all. I mean, yeah. I really enjoy the research and development we do in AirCam uh, with the AirCam, you know, continuing to develop it and support it. Um, but I also uh, really enjoy uh, uh, supporting the engines mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the tech support that we do the, uh, and, and the service work we do, just seeing the engines and solving problems and you know keeping everybody safe. Yeah, do you miss going back to Africa? Or? Uh, yeah, I mean I had some great adventures there. The business has grown so much over the years that it hasn't really given me the time to, mm -hmm. to do that stuff. I did all that stuff <laughs> years ago when I when I was starting the business and I had more time and uh, the, the demands on my time have grown right so it's harder to do that now but uh, uh, I'll go back. Yeah. Usually you see missionary workers with their airplanes mm -hmm. flying uh, medical supplies around, so I think you would be an anomaly whenever you were there with National Geographic. You know, we were in such remote areas that there was just no, nobody there. Uh, but, uh, you know, the wildlife uh, research teams were really great people to work with. They're yeah. so dedicated mm -hmm. to what they're doing. And they were just all wonderful people, not, not only uh, talented in the photography and the filming, but, but uh, also really dedicated to try and uh, save the wildlife. Mm -hmm. uh, that, it's commendable, isn't it? Mm -hmm. right. So what do you see the future then uh, for this type of uh, engine? Well, the, you know, the Rotex engines have a great future because uh, they're developing these new fuel-injected engines. As I mentioned, they're better at dealing with uh, modern auto gas. Uh, than just about any other engine out there. They, uh, they are lightweight, they're compact, they've got high TBOs, they're very reliable, uh, they're uh, relatively easy to operate. So the fuel-injected engines, not only are they very efficient, but they, they actually go lean a peak automatically. So as soon as the computer sees a combination of uh, manifold pressure RPM that is safe to go lean a peak, it just does it. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to worry about the pilot making a mistake trying to operate Lena Peak and, and maybe uh, burning up a cylinder. Or oh, that's, that's encouraging. It's so really you nice. You don't have yeah. to pull back until you well, feel or, something. Or they forget, uh -huh. right, and they're uh -huh. wasting fuel. So in this right. case, the engine is going to do it for oh, you. Oh, wow. So that's you're always going to have the right. optimum fuel burn. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's a big sales. Yep. Yeah, and, and, we, and, and safety. We're all right. about safety here yep. at Florida Aviation Network, so that's a big safety a feature as well. Absolutely. Um, you're less likely to have an engine failure due to a, mm -hmm. uh, something the pilot forgot to do or didn't do. Right. You know, the mixture on all the Rotax engines, the mixture is fully um, automatic. Oh, on all of them. Oh, boy, that is a good Yeah. You wonder how many accidents or incidents that have happened through the years because of that. 
single item yeah sure uh, yeah. you know I, I mean even with a fuel injected engine I mean if it's a really hot day and you're at high density altitudes boy you're gonna lose power you know you might even have to lean a little on takeoff right in mm -hmm. some cases mm -hmm. all those things are taken away with the Rotex it's gonna lean it's gonna control the mixture for you and it's gonna be at an optimum level no matter what the power setting Great, great. Well, thank you so much, Phil. I know that you're here. Where exactly are you located on the field here? If, uh, so friends are coming? Lockwood Aviation Supply is in Building D. Okay. We're actually right uh, right next to Garmin okay. in Building Good D. Good neighbors. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the Rotax uh, uh, booth is, is just a few spaces down from us in Building D as well. Okay. Good, good. Well, thank you very much, and thanks for bringing the good news about the engine. Yeah. That's great. We appreciate you coming. Absolutely my pleasure. <laughs> well, thank you. This was Tweet Coleman from uh, the Florida Aviation Network. Thanks for being with us, and hope to see you in the next couple of days here at Sun and Fun. It is the 49th anniversary here at Sun and Fun, so see you on the field. <laughs>